Sound Speeds. Welcome back to the Sound Speeds podcast. Now, before we get going, a quick announcement. Over seven years ago, Sound Speeds as a YouTube channel officially launched, but I wanted to dial in the look and everything before I launched the first video. So as of our next video, we've been releasing videos for seven years. And a few friends that are pretty close to me understand that since the strikes last year, it's been very difficult for me to produce videos, not just because of the financial amount that it, co it costs to actually keep a YouTube channel going. Believe it or not, there is one. As, as well as the time. Well, not a whole lot can be done about the time, but there is something that can be done about the finances. Now, I'm not the kind of person that asks for like, share, subscribes, and donations, but what I'm going to do is start in, in basically adopting a value for value meth, uh, uh, method model, I guess it is, towards the... Um, uh, towards this channel. So that way, if you are a Patreon or YouTube channel member, which there should be some sort of a recognition for that, your name are is going to be in the credits of every episode of the show. And if you do any kind of a donation up to $25, then you're going to get a producer credit. And if there's basically every single amount that's over $25, it's going to basically deduct $25 from the donation every single week, and you will get a, a producer credit going forward for that amount of time. If there's a $100 donation for whatever reason, you get five episodes. So there you go. Uh, you can, since this is a film-related thing, production, credits are something that uh, people like to see their name in. And I figured that since I'm a film guy, it makes sense for me to do credits. And so the outro of the show, which is always, thanks for tuning in this episode of Soundspeeds and blah, 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 blah. There's going to be the names of the people who are financially backing this channel. And so this value for value Model is one, if you're not very familiar with it, it is basically if you would like to contribute something towards it. So it doesn't need to necessarily be money. It could be if you would like to participate in some way or if you would like to contribute in some way to this channel. Shoot me an email at alan at soundspeeds.us and we can talk about it. But without further delay, let's get right into our content. One of the questions I've been asked for quite a while is that when I do my microphone test, especially shotgun microphones and microphones that we would use in the film industry, why do I go higher and higher overhead until I get to a ludicrous height of something like, you know, in the case of the Rode NTG8, I went 32 and a half feet over the top of my head? Well, the reason why is because in the film industry, you want to hear the reach of a microphone. And I know some people are like, there is technically no reach. It's the, the pickup pattern and the signal to noise ratio and stuff like that. Okay, the term that people always refer to is reach and rejection. Those are the two terms. Reach, meaning how much can you pick up distance off of the microphone and rejection, meaning how much is the off axis attenuated. So those two are common terms that people refer to. Just like years ago, I was teaching a class and someone told me, don't refer to it as a shotgun microphone. That is incorrect. You could refer to it instead as a low bar interference tube. So I'm expected to call it a low bar interference tube and to tell my class, don't call it a shotgun microphone. Don't call it a shotgun microphone. Call it a low bar interference tube because a shotgun microphone is a wrong term. Obviously, I didn't do that because that was a very, very stupid suggestion. And I was like, no, you're an idiot. So that was something that I am not about to do, nor was I back then. That was like 10 years ago. But anyway, so the reason why I go higher and higher overhead is because in various different scenarios, you want to hear the way the microphone sounds. Sometimes people under boom if they're doing ENG or something like that. And they like to, to you know, maybe they're trying to under boom in order to see how the sun is, uh, you know, with, with it, under booming facing upward because the sun is casting a shadow and the only angle you can come in at. And you have to under boom. And so I do that test. I also do a test where I'm angled in kind of overhead. The, the face is here and I'm kind of out and about. Uh, in front, which is very much also an ENG style uh, technique. So people can easily hear the way that it sounds over and in front, you know, by two or three feet. So if you don't want to under boom, you can still come in at a little bit of a wider angle and still get it. Now, in the film industry, we normally go overhead. And if it is point blank to the top of your head or it is 16 feet overhead, that will give you a good indicator as to exactly how the microphone is going to sound. Now, for short shotgun microphones, I really don't need to go past about, you know, 11 or 12 feet because at that height, it's pretty ridiculous. But one of the things that I, I really do like 
that no one else does is going higher and higher overhead with my microphone test. And so I'm going to continue to do that. Many people, when they review microphones, they simply go into a studio and they talk into the thing from here and they might go out in the field and put it a foot over their head and say, this is the way the thing sounds. But in the real world, in the film industry, you don't always have the luxury of getting it right on top of the frame or within a foot. And so if you have to be farther and farther away, sometimes sound mixers are like, no, under a no, a no circumstances is going to play the lav. I'm going to be playing perspective. So you get as close as you can to can with the boom. And then we're going to be playing that. Well, if you want to hear how that's going to sound, that's the reason why you're going to come to a sound speeds video. Because uh, if, for example, we can't get a, a wireless microphone on the person, maybe it's a stunt sequence. Maybe it's uh, you're far enough away and you want to hear how the effects are going to be going with someone jumping off of something and yelling on their way down of a high of a high drop or something like that. You might want to hear the way something is going to sound when it is farther away. And for that reason, I like to test microphones at that distance. Now, I don't always do microphone comparisons where I compare one microphone to another one. Sometimes I just test the microphone for its merit alone. And the reason why is because it doesn't matter what you use when you are on a film set. Post gets what they get, and they're probably not going to be nitpicking that sound provided it sounds good. If it's on axis, if the detail is there, if it if they're not having intelligibility issues, basically, if it's not too far away or too far off axis, there's going to be a whole bunch of different, uh, you know, reasons why they were going to like whatever it is. It doesn't matter if you're using a 416 or if you're using a $200 uh, knockoff. Post might not be able to tell the difference if you're a foot overhead. And I know that's not me, you know, giving a whole lot of, um, you know, credit to the 416. Have everybody say, wait a minute, the 416 is a great sounding microphone. Why would you think that a $200 microphone is going to rival it? I'm not saying it, it was going to rival it. But when Post only knows what they know, then they don't know what they're what they don't know. And it takes a very critical ear and someone who says, wait a minute, I know the way a 416 sounded. That doesn't sound like a 416. However, it could be any one of a bunch of other microphones that people are using because we do put metadata on each track that we have. So Post is going to be able to match a microphone for ADR purposes. So if they are looking at it and they say, oh, well, what do you know? That's actually a fairly inexpensive microphone. They might bellyache about it, but usually that would be if there's some sort of a of a gear or a um, a uh, manufacturer snob. Sometimes uh, people will just not like a particular manufacturer. Like I, I know, for example, a lot of people in the film industry laugh and make fun of Rode. They say you don't want to have use a Rode on set. The fact of the matter is, though. Rode actually makes some pretty good microphones. And if you're wondering why why it is that I'm able to say that when the price isn't nearly as high as others, well, does price indicate quality? Because if price is really, you know, an, an indicator of quality, and if I were to buy cheap Chinese components from China and I have a warehouse and I put them together in Antarctica and then I ship them out worldwide, I'm going to have to sell them at Neumann prices in order to turn a profit. Does that make them better than it would be if I were to make them in China and then send them out worldwide? It's the same exact microphone. But the thing about Rode is they source very good premium quality components from China, which is not very far away from Australia. Then they manufacture it in-house in their, stu in their um, manufacturing facilities, and then they send them out in bulk across the world. And because the Australian dollar is worth a lot less than the uh, US American dollar, they're able to offer really good microphones at a lot cheaper than you would normally expect to see them from other manufacturers. So that's one of the reasons why they're che they're cheaper than you would expect them to see them other in other countries. So that being said, as long as you are using a good quality microphone that sounds detail detailed enough, it's on axis, it's not you know uh, you know being you know you don't have popping and modulation issues, and you don't have too much you know that you're trying to just reject out because you didn't bother to shut down any noises. You're probably not going to be able to tell much of a difference. However. The reason why I do the testing that I do higher and higher overhead, usually in a noisy environment, is because I want you to hear how that microphone sounds when I go higher and higher overhead. I'm also going to do testing maybe three feet or so overhead inside of certain types of, of rooms and environments 
That way you can get an idea of what it would sound like indoors as well. Because if you're inside of a reverberant room and you're inside of a room with, you know, carpet on the floor and that kind of thing, they are going to sound different. So that's the reason why I do the testing I, te I do. And that's the reason why I don't always do a comparison because in the real world, as long as you like the sound that you're getting out of a microphone, your audience is not going to know or do they really care? Have you ever watched a network or cable television show? Maybe not in the modern era, unless it's something like the Super Bowl or some sort of a sports event that you're into, but maybe going back to the 90s or maybe even the 80s, maybe before that even. If so, let me ask you this. Do you remember when television shows used to be a certain loudness and you'd set your volume there and then all of a sudden the commercial would come on and it would blast your ear, ears apart? And sometimes... Those commercials would be loud enough to wake up the household because you would set your volume for the television show and then suddenly it would be a lot louder when you got to the commercials. Why is that? Because there were certain loud, loudness standards set into effect that the television shows had to be engineered to. LKFS in America and LUFS overseas in Europe. And if you watch Curtis Judge YouTube channel, usually he goes to the LUFS LUFS, negative 23 LUFS, which is the European standard. And I believe in the United States, it's negative 24 LKFS. But I am not on that end of television. That's more broadcast. And that is going off of memory. So you might want to double check me on that. I could be mistaken. The reason why I'm throwing that up there is because while television stations had a loudness requirement, commercials did not. If you wanted to pay your money to the TV station, they didn't care if they would blast someone's ears, ears apart. They just wanted your money. And for that reason, the technical standards were not nearly as high for commercials. And for that reason, they knew how to make their shows louder. Their commercials were louder, for example, and they wanted to pull attention to that. So if they did that, and suddenly it was so much louder than the actual program television show and people were like, whoa, I got to turn down the volume. You were seeing loudness in its full effect and what it does. If you go on YouTube, people will basically do whatever they want to with their volume. Sometimes it's very low volume. Sometimes people are screaming into their microphone. Sometimes it's overly loud. Sometimes it's too quiet. It kind of depends. But if you are a content creator or you do any kind of a project that is going to be put up online, it is strongly recommended that you do something called leveling. This is different than normalizing. Normalizing can be just picking a certain level like negative one dB and putting your loudest part of your, your volume even with negative one dB and then everything else is below that. Or you can do more of a LUFS or LKFS standard where it normalizes and kind of brings everything up to within that certain, um, uh, within a certain realm before it gets above a certain criteria, before it gets above that, that threshold that you give it. But what I usually recommend that people do is run it through a leveling process. And the reason why is because what leveling will do is it's basically like someone riding the volume live. It's not going to be cranking it up really fast. And this is different than compression. What compression does is it allows you to set a certain volume. And if the volume goes below a certain bit, then what it might do is bring it up ever so slightly. So if I'm speaking loud like I am right now, and then suddenly I get a little bit quieter or I get farther away from the microphone, it will start to bring up the level a little bit. And if I get really, really loud again, it will bring the level back down. That's kind of what compression does. It brings up the level and all of a sudden you're going to hear the noise floor quite a bit more noticeably. If you ever watch the TV show Judge Judy or any other uh, of these courtroom television shows, you will notice that whenever the judge goes quiet and starts shuffling through the papers, you hear the background noise level come way up. And that's because there's nothing going on except a little bit of page turn, uh, page turning and stuff like that. But the level all of a sudden comes way up. That's compression. It's different than it is if you were to level it. What leveling will do is it's basically like someone riding the volume, keeping everything now nice and loud the whole entire time. How is this different than um, than than if you were to, to just use compression? Well, if they're quiet, it's not going to bring up the level to the point where it's all buzzing and noise floor or whatever. It's going to keep it there waiting for there to be a pretty decent level. And you can use different types of software to level your audio. I used to use Auphonic. And if you go to Auphonic's website, which is A-U-P-H-O-N-I-C.com, you can uh, upload, I think it's, 
you can get like two hours free per month. And then you can either buy coupons or tokens or whatever they call it in order to get more than that if you're going to be exceeding that. Or if you go in the upper right-hand corner, at least it used to be when I bought it, um, you used to be able to buy an actual version of it, which is offline. I think it was $79 when I bought it. might have been on sale. But it would allow you to actually level the audio using their tool. And there was various different features in there. Adaptive, you could set the different the levels a- a- accordingly. But as you guys know, I use Reaper as my DAW. And inside of Reaper, there is a way for you to level everything as part of the post process. So I use Reaper now to level everything once I get everything happy. So if you've been watching my channel for a while, you know that I always knock out my, ro- my, my background noise level. And then I will, um, and then after I ba- basically do that, I will add some compression. Then I will level it. The reason I add the compression after the, I, I remove the background noise is because it's not going to change my noise floor. And compression-wise, it's going to keep my, my volume relatively the same. And then leveling is going to keep it up at the same kind of volume. Now, why is this a critical thing that I recommend? It's because it keeps people from having to constantly adjust their audio level. If you're watching something, especially a longer video, you don't want to have to, to go up and down on your volume, especially if you're using your tele, your, your phone. I just said telephone, that's old school. But if you're using your phone and you're watching a video and then all of a sudden it gets louder in your vicinity, you might have to adjust your volume. But if things are relatively quiet and the volume goes up and down and you constantly have to adjust the audio level, that's annoying. It's one thing when you're compensating for a louder environment. It's another thing altogether when you are constantly having to go up and down on the volume of a video because it wasn't engineered correctly. So leveling is extremely critical and I highly recommend you do it. So there you have it. Another episode of the Sound Speeds podcast in the can. I'll go ahead and say it. And at this point in the video, if this were the next episode, now is when you would be seeing the Patreons and the YouTube channel members up on the screen. I am not doing that until that video and it will be fluctuating according to those members. And it doesn't matter what level that you decide to join at. It will be one of those things where you're you're going to be mentioned at the very, very end of the video. So... There you go. Um, If you happen to be a Patreon or a channel member, you're going to receive a notification telling you that I'm going to start putting names in there. And if you don't want to be listed, you will have the option of telling me you don't want to be. I'm not going to continue to chat your ear off. This episode is over. Thanks for tuning in this episode of Sound Speeds Podcast, and I will be bringing you more sound advice in the future. With some more sound advice. I've screwed up my own saying. Great. Have a question you'd like answered or want to add something? Be sure to write it in the comment section down below. You can also make a suggestion for future topics of discussion. Again, comment section down below or you can email me at soundspeeds at yahoo.com. Be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you won't miss out on future sound advice.